begins our week-long series, Black At, Private Education and Race, diving into the dozens of Instagram accounts that took aim at New York City's elite and predominantly white private high schools over the summer. The Black At Instagram movement created a platform for black students to share their experiences inside these institutions. Black At Brerley and Black At Chapin were among the first accounts to address the issue. And now, almost every private school in New York City and across the U.S. are joining in. So we spoke to Columbia Grammar and Preparatory School alumna Lauren Gloucester, who helps run the Instagram account True Colors of Columbia. Why do you think this um, trend started? Why do you think that uh, people or kids felt like they needed this type of an outlet? Um, I mean, I think that the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, um, because of George Floyd and everything that's been going on recently, um, this really helped give black and, you know, people of color, um, a platform and an opportunity to amplify our voices and be heard. And, um, I mean, this is a long time coming. Um, we've been silenced and frustrated and, you know, hurt for so long. And, um, you know, this movement, was um, and is what we need in order to make our voices heard. Mm -hmm. So your account posts just some of the many messages and testimonies from students, from parents, alumni, teachers. Give us a sense of what administrators are seeing and the insight it gives them into how serious the racism issue is within elite private schools. Of course. I mean, um, this is a new information, and um, I know that, you know, this has been said to be, quote unquote, shocking. Um, I really don't think that it is. Um, this is pretty known information. Students have gone up and expressed their pain and their hurt and their frustration. Um, I just think that now that it's all coming in full force and um, it's so many of us that are speaking out about our experiences, um, that they truly want to listen to what we have to say. Um, and it's it's unifying to see you know all of these students and faculty and parents coming together and expressing um, their stories um, and it's also so painful and traumatic almost um, to see so many people having to relive and express things that you have also gone through within a predominantly white institution um, so it's a really painful experience honestly especially to be running this account it's painful um, you know, in, in my experience, and you can sort of correct me if you've had a different experience, a lot of these private schools have, um, you know, mottos or mantras that they try to live by. There's always a focus, aside from academics, um, there's always a focus on volunteerism, being a good uh, civic, civic mindedness and that sort of, of thing. Um, it's supposed to be woven into the culture of the school. Um, and I'm wondering why with that focus, do you think, that many of these students are are having different experiences that they don't find that they're having in the public school system or the charter school system, that even though there is a supposed to be a focus on being sort of a good citizen in many of these schools, clearly there are a number of kids who don't feel like they're part of that community. Yeah, you know, I think that a big part of this is that there isn't um, an explicit anti-racism, um, you know, clause mm -hmm. and all of that. And so even though, you know, these are supposed to be welcoming communities and accepting communities, um, you know, the fact that the school is anti-racist is not explicitly stated um, in a student handbook or in any other place. And that, you know, along with um, no disciplinary action or very little disciplinary action for students um, or faculty members who, um, you know, are involved in racially charged incidents. Um, it's difficult for students to feel safe um, in their communities and they feel so isolated, um, you know, and one of the things that uh, my fellow admins and I have been talking about is how during our experience at, you know, Columbia Prep, we weren't just students. Uh, we served as teachers and administrators. Um, we had to, or we were expected to teach about slavery when we, you know, weren't around during slave times. Um, and we were expected to speak to the faculty and administration about how, what microaggressions are and how to confront microaggressions. And, um, that shouldn't be our job. And, you know, we sort of felt like we had to make that our job if we wanted not us to feel safe, but the younger generation of, 
you know, kids of color and faculty of color to feel safe. Um, yeah, it, it's such an important point that you make there. And yet, I, I got to wonder, um, what is it specifically about the private school experience that differs from, let's say, a public school or a charter school? Uh, I am a proud product of New York City public school education. Uh, there were a couple of years that I went to uh, Catholic school, but for the most part, I was educated through the public school system. Um, and even in my undergraduate university, it was a public university. And so I'm wondering, um, as as you know, respected as some of these institutions are, and as the many things that they try to expose students to, um, do you feel that students of color are properly prepared to enter an environment within those private schools? And more importantly, are they prepared uh, once they leave them? Um, on an academic basis, I feel as though I was 100%, um, you know, I'm 100% ready to tackle any sort of um, situation. I think on a social um, perspective, absolutely not. I think that it's really difficult for students of color to not only not see themselves represented within their own student body, but also their faculty. And um, the only place that we really see ourselves is in our uh, cafeteria staff, in our cleaning staff, and in our security team. And while those are essential members to our community, um, they also don't get the same respect that our administration and white faculty do. Um, you know, and they fall prey to a lot of disrespect from students and faculty alike. And so, you know, at that point, what does it mean for, you know, students of color when the adults who are also of color don't receive respect? You know, I think it's so interesting, Lauren, is a lot of these schools um, actually sort of seek out uh, diverse candidates, right? They, they they understand that diversity in the student body is valuable. And so some of these schools are like super duper expensive. And so they offer scholarships and they go out of their way to woo um, children of color. But then it almost seems like it kind of stops there. And, and let me be very clear, you don't get into these schools unless academically, you are very, very advanced, right? So it's not about making a place for someone who doesn't deserve it. The, the kids who get into these schools deserve it. Um, but there is sort of a push, there has been a push for at least some diversity, but then it stops. Um, I, I don't think people sort of will truly understand what um, some kids go through. So you've been collecting these stories. Can you just give me like a couple of examples that really stand out to you um, of some of the stuff that has really bothered some of these students? Yeah, um, first, thank you for making that distinction um, earlier about students who do receive scholarship and are of color that they do, in fact, deserve to be there um, on an academic basis. Um, and so, you know, I think that um, a lot of the, the trauma stems, it's not just um, emotional and verbal, but it's also even physical. Um, you know, I myself have been physically assaulted by students, white students, um, in my school because I'm not as affluent as they are. Um, you know, students have been threatened to be lynched or said that they could be lynched. Um, you know, we have even parents who engage in a similar type of behavior. And so when you feel cornered by not just your student body, but your faculty and your um, administration and the parents around you, it's really, really difficult to feel as though you are a fully matriculated member of the community and that you have the same rights as everyone else in your community. You know, I'm so glad that we're able to have this discussion with you, Lauren, because it is really eye-opening, I think, and will be eye-opening for our audience to understand this. We just threw up some of the um, comments that uh, people have made and, and how people feel when those comments are made. And I think that uh, there's often a sense, and I think Emery pointed, out, uh, pointed this out a little earlier, that there's a sense that the people, uh, the young people who attend these schools are somehow going to be exposed to a wide range of cultures and a wide range of, of issues and um, uh, that the education is gonna be par excellence. But in fact, uh, when you see the comments that are made at people of color, um, you understand that this all comes from a place that is very, very hard to overcome. And for many, many, many years, and this is, I think, what is important about what you are doing and what others like you are doing. For many, many years, people have had to just sort of grin and bear it. 
you just grin and bear it. You just say to yourself, you know, that that is, I just gotta put my head down and I can hear my mother talking to me right now. You know, don't worry about what people say. Don't worry about, uh, you know, sticks and stones, yada, yada, yada. Just do your work, get an A, and no one can ever take that away from you. No one can ever question you without ever thinking, and this isn't a reflection of my upbringing, but without ever thinking about the psychic pain that uh, starts very early for young people of color um, and that go carries on into their adulthood. And on the flip side, the people who use that kind of language who you would say, they, they would say to you, I'm not racist, I'm, you know, I love everybody, but they use that kind of language. So right. with that being said, how is, how are administrators responding to this? Um, what are you hoping to see from Columbia Prep now that this account is out um, and other accounts like this are out? Yeah, so one of, um, actually, you know, um, the leaders of, or some of the leaders of this um, account were um, former members of our multi-ethnic um, cultural awareness club. And so um, we had actually presented the administration with a list of things that we would like to see done in order to help protect the students of color after um, a really troubling uh, racial incident that occurred this year. Um, and so, you know, we sort of uh, took that and we um, extended it and we um, added more points to it. And so we'd really love to see um, the administration implement uh, that criteria. And we feel that it is 100 percent necessary that every point be met in order to ensure the safety of every student, especially the students of color. And, um, you know, I I do understand that um, they have hired a uh, diversity uh, consultant um, and that they are making changes to the curriculum. But at this time, we feel like that's not enough and more needs to be done in order to help protect these students. Listen, Lauren, I just want to kind of take my hat off to you and the other students who are, you know, part of this kind of whole movement. Vlad and I often talked about how, you know, when we were your age, um, we would never have the guts to speak out in this way. Every student that I've ever spoken to has gone to a, a private school has always talked about how academically prepared they were for college, how they really appreciated all the opportunities that that environment gave them that maybe they wouldn't have been able to get. But this is a big area that I think is lacking and you guys shining a light on it is admirable. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Columbia Grammar and Preparatory School has responded to the accusations made on the true colors of Columbia Instagram account. In a statement, head of school Bill Donahue said, in part, quote, systemic racism exists at CGPS, and we apologize that we did not provide an inclusive and equitable environment for our BIPOC students and alumni. It is unacceptable. The full response is available at cbsnews.com slash race in school.